some stories that might be familiar to you. Jasmine and Jeff brought their kids up in the church, but now they're lucky if they get there at Christmas or Easter. Uh, Mary spent her whole life going to church. She's 35 years old now, but she feels less and less like she belongs because she never married like all of her Christian friends. She finds herself preferring to go to the gym or even staying at home instead of going to church these days. Aaron didn't grow up in the church, but at uni he became interested in spirituality and started to adopt bits and pieces of different faiths as it suited him. Increasingly, he is appreciating attending a traditional church and taking part in communion. Far isn't a Christian at all, but she likes going to church because she likes the singing it reminds her of home. And Thomas used to attend church with his family in Kingaroy, but since his son died suddenly, he just can't bring himself anymore to go back to church. Why would God take his son away? Shan is staying temporarily in a DV shelter. Her kids are in care and she's been struggling with drug and alcohol use. She's trying to get better and trying to get her kids back again. And as a part of the recovery, she started wondering if perhaps a higher power is something she needs. None of these stories are unfamiliar to us. They're stories that reflect the lives of people we know, neighbours we chat with over the fence or perhaps people we work with. As I'm sure you have heard, our most recent census data from 2021 reports that 43.9% of the population describe themselves as Christian, while 38.9% describe themselves as having no religious affiliation at all. This is a rise of 6.8% in 2001 to 2011, and in the last 10 years, it's a further rise of 15.8%. Now, in my mind, um, 43.9% still sounds really high. But internationally, we're in the bottom half. And that actually surprised me when I looked at it. Of the English-speaking world, only India and New Zealand have a lower percentage of Christians than Australia. And only one European country has less than us, the Netherlands. I mean, we should always treat these figures you know, with some suspicion, um, as people in Christian majority countries are probably feeling pressured to claim Christian faith and people in Christian minority countries are probably pressured to deny it. But if you think about the people you know, does it seem likely to you that um, 40% of the people that you meet would identify as Christian? The SBS recently aired Um, a show called Keeping the Faith, or it was a part of a show called Insight, and the episode was called Keeping the Faith, where they gathered people from all walks of life, um, all having a different story to tell around their journey of faith and spirituality. There was a young woman who'd converted from Catholicism to to Islam, an Anglican priest, now a Uniting Church minister who identified as trans, Christians who had walked away from their faith, for various reasons, and then others who had found faith for various reasons. All of them people who had played on the edges of faith and found themselves in this place of belief or disbelief. For those who found themselves in this state of disbelief, there were some common themes that were emerging um, as the program aired. The first was, a growing dissatisfaction with institutions. And that's not limited to the church. It includes clubs and politics and unions, basically any membership-based organisation. There have been many ways in which institutions have damaged the relationship with people, including the church. The second was dissatisfaction with the way life had turned out and Christians who had then used theodicy as a way of explaining their pain or their suffering. You know, um, God doesn't give you anything you can't handle, those kinds of comments. The third was this, social pressures within the church for women who are stereotyped into roles 
stereotyped as needing to be married, needing to procreate, um, needing to be a caregiver. And the fourth one was this, feelings, people that felt guilty or shameful or sinful and the impact that it then had on their sense of self and identity. Jesus is famous for identifying and working with people on the fringe, people on the edges. His fights are almost exclusively reserved for those who are privileged and powerful. He chooses disciples from among the uneducated, uh, the uncivilized men of Galilee, including a traitorous tax collector. He spends time with and values women, which shouldn't be surprising for us today, but in that context, it was unheard of. He sits with children and allows them to come to him. He mixes with the ritually unclean and the sinful, even though according to the Jewish law, that would make him unclean. Jesus intentionally goes to the margins, to the edges, to the fringe. And the woman we meet in our reading today, the eponymous woman at the well, is on the margins in so many ways. She's a woman. She's a Samaritan, which in this instance is a racial divide, um, a cultural divide, and a religious divide. She is, according to Jewish law, an adulteress, and even her presence at the well in the middle of the day is suspicious. She is, in almost every way, on the margins. And I want to spend some time unpacking that. The first thing is we're told that Jesus was traveling through Samaria and this, that this well was at Sychar. Sychar doesn't exist anymore, at least not by that name, um, but is probably at or near Nablus. I don't know if you can see that, those online can. Um, Nablus, in the Palestinian West Bank. It's 50 kilometers from nor the north of, Jer north of Jerusalem. And it's a place that has this long, complicated history. The area's first settlement was about 6,000 years ago, by which time the area was already being farmed. It was Canaanite. It was occupied by Abraham and Jacob, and it's where Jacob's well and Jacob's burial site is located. It was Egyptian, then Canaanite again. It was conquered during the exile and given to Joseph's descendants. It was part of the short-lived Jewish kingdom it's where, after Solomon's death, Israel split into two and it became the capital of the northern kingdom. It was conquered by Assyria, who moved the people all around and during the Babylonian exile, it became the centre of worship for the Jews who were the remnant, those who remained and weren't allowed to go back to Jerusalem. It was Greek. It was Roman. It was the capital of Samaria. And that's all before Jesus gets to the well. Since then, it's been Roman and Palestinian and Muslim and Palestinian and Ottoman and English and Palestinian and Israeli, but still Palestinian. Like almost everywhere in Palestine, this long, complicated history allows everyone to claim the land as their own. Jesus is traveling through Samaria. This, this makes Jesus a visitor in this story. He's the foreigner, the alien, the interloper. Normally, this would give the local woman more power. I mean, it is her country. But Jesus, as a Jew, also has this long ancestral claim to the land. And the woman seems to recognize that because the ancient patriarchs of the Jewish faith, or the Jewish people, are also the ancient patriarchs of the Samaritans. The Samaritans believed that they were the true descendants of Israel. They had their own version of the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, and they thought theirs was the original one. On the other side, the Jews believed that the Samaritans were less Jewish than them, a mixed race people for all the reasons we just mentioned. Some were Jews, also Assyrians, other nations, who the Assyrians then uh, relocated to Samaria. But they also believed that the Samaritans were less Jewish because their faith practices had been mixed with all these other faiths. 
And it's into this complicated context the woman is drawing water from the well in the middle of the day. Scholars and theologians have made much of these words. It was about noon. About noon, they say. Isn't that strange for a woman to be drawing water from the well, they say? Wouldn't it make sense for the locals to fetch their water in the cool of the morning or the afternoon? Why is she out in the middle of the day? At one level, it's a ridiculous question to ask. We have no way of knowing why she's there in the middle of the day. Maybe her child was sick. Maybe everything's running behind today. Maybe she gets social anxiety and prefers to go when it's quiet. Maybe she's been traveling and she's on her way home after selling all of her wares at the market. We do not know and we cannot know for sure. But in the absence of knowing for sure and from a mindset that then assumes that every word is super meaningful, we form these theories about why she might have been at the well in the middle of the day. We assume, firstly, that it's her regular routine, but we actually have no reason to believe this. But it's become an accepted fact. Maybe she was an outsider, rejected even by her people, not welcome to fetch water when everyone else does. Maybe she's a prostitute, intentionally there in the middle of the day to attract clients amongst the travelers. And as an aside, of the hundreds and hundreds of possible reasons why she might be at the well, why do we focus on the two options that suggest there is something wrong with her? What else do we find out about the woman as the story unfolds? Well, we know she's had five husbands. We know that the man she's currently with isn't her husband. We don't know why. We don't know if she was divorced or abandoned or mixture of these things, but we have this te tendency to assume that having had five husbands is in some way very shameful, that it indicates something negative about this woman's morality, her moral character. But that's not actually what the story tells us. It's not part of the story. Instead, that's us reading morality into the story. When Jesus speaks to her about her marital history, there's nothing in her response, or even his, which suggests shame or guilt. She doesn't apologize or make excuses. She doesn't cower. She doesn't turn away from Jesus. Instead, she turns towards Jesus. This miraculous knowledge shows that he must be a prophet. He's a prophet and he's Jewish. So she asks him very normal questions about faith and about worship and about the differences in belief between the Samaritans and the Jews. And then in verse 27, the rest of the disciples arrive and they're surprised. They're surprised to find Jesus talking with a woman, but they don't question or challenge it. In fact, the author of John suggests the questions that they didn't say that maybe they should have, like, what do you want and uh, why are you talking with her? But from a straight reading of the scripture, they seem to be surprised by Jesus talking to a woman, not this woman in particular. We're then told that after this encounter, the woman returns home and tells everyone about the prophet that she's met at the well and how he could be the Messiah. And as a result of her testimony, many come to faith in Jesus. And Jesus is persuaded to stay a bit longer in Samaria. And again, I'm probably repeating myself, but there's nothing in the response of the other Samaritans to suggest that um, she's somehow living a shameful life because they accept her word easily and they follow her to meet Jesus. There's this very real sense in which this is a risky interaction. Risky for Jesus, risky for the woman. It's unusual for a Jew to interact with a Samaritan, a point the woman makes clear when Jesus asks for a drink. And it's unusual for a man to interact like this with a woman, a point emphasized by the disciples' shock when they arrive. Both 
Jesus and the woman are vulnerable. Their people might judge them for talking together. The Jews would judge Jesus, the Samaritans would judge the woman, men would judge Jesus, women would judge the Samaritan, each of them taking risks, and one of those risks is that they will be judged by who they associate with. But Jesus and the woman bring their whole selves into the conversation. We're told that Jesus is tired from travel, that he's actually thirsty, not metaphorically. He requests a drink, and it's not some object lesson, he's thirsty. And she is actually at the well to draw water, not to pick up men, at least that's what the scripture tells us. He brings his Jewish faith and his culture to the conversation, and so does she. She forms opinions about him because he's Jewish. She assumes he won't want water from her. She assumes uh, that he will tell her that her faith practices are wrong and that his are right. But as the conversation unfolds, they find common ground. They find commonality in their past, the patriarchs that they share, and they find commonality in the imagined future that Jesus lays out for her, where worship will happen, not on a mountain, not in a temple, but in spirit and in truth. But as they encounter each other, as they are vulnerable, with each other, these new truths emerge. These new truths about their common humanity and their common faith. They're worshiping in spirit and in truth. They're like two beggars asking each other for bread, or in this case, water, um, both vulnerable, both in need, both with something to give the other. We know that the woman's changed by the interaction but it's easy to overlook that Jesus is also changed. Jesus was on his way to Galilee. He had no intention of stopping in Samaria. He had no intention of teaching the Samaritans, but because of this interaction, his plans change and the scope broadens in his ministry. The woman at the well and Jesus are both changed over a cup of water. We started with stories of people on the margins of faith, those leaving faith behind or connecting with faith or with church for the first time. And we see in our scripture today, one story of Jesus meeting someone on the margins. So much of our activity in life is on the margins or at least should be. We find ourselves stretched and challenged, not when we're comfortable, when things are easy, but when we take risks, when we become vulnerable, when we allow our lives and our, to live and love and play on the edges. The reality is those who have walked away from faith are no further away from God than when they found it. God hasn't left them. The Spirit of God is at work in and around us all the time. Wherever there is love, God is present. Wherever there is kindness, God is. Wherever there is forgiveness, God is. Friends, it is for love that Christ lived, and it is for love that Christ died. And it is for love that Christ lives today. Let's pray. Christ, you come to us as one who is thirsty, asking for a drink, and yet you are the one quenching our spiritual thirst. Take us out of our comfort zone, push us to the edges where we can encounter and serve. Wherein our faith is shaky, help us to remember that you are no further away from us than when we were confident and full of trust. Help us to remember that there are no dividing lines. There is no us and them. 